Good evening, Board Chair Galbraith, Board Members, Dr. Cleveland, Dr. Cleveland, your Cabinet, the community members, and Dr. Murphy. It is my privilege to be here, and traveling 1,400 miles by an airplane is, is an easy thing to do, <laughs> really, and, and no, no hiccups this time, so that was really nice. But thank you for bringing me here and making this presentation that I'm so very pleased on behalf of the accreditation team to present to the community of Rio Rancho Public Schools. Before I begin, I want to say congratulations. This is, this is a time to celebrate. Um, yes, we are gonna hear information about successes of the district. You're also gonna hear about the findings where the team really researched and believes that you can improve. But most importantly, this is a time to celebrate your success. And I wanna say in the very beginning that your IEQ score, and we'll talk more about that later, is exceptionally high. The IEQ is the Index of Educational Quality, and it's exceptionally high, especially for a first-time district to be accredited. So if I might ask everyone just to say yay or clap or something, because it is tremendous. So let's get down to business. Um, a little bit about Cognia first. And you can see from the slide, this is what we believe and we, we actually live it. We know schools because we're in schools. Now for the past two and a half years, we're gonna be realistic. We have not been physically in schools. We've had to conduct our reviews remotely. But prior to that, we were face-to-face -face in schools. And for a district accreditation review, typically that is a three-day on-site review. So with the Zoom capability that we had, and thank you so much to Carl's team and Carol for all the logistics that they handled, we conducted all the review parts uh, through Zoom, and it worked seamlessly. But Cognia itself is a global nonprofit organization, and Dr. Cleveland gave a really good description of Cognia. But I want to also add to that that we accredit seven different institution types. So that ranges from independent schools, like she mentioned earlier, high schools, districts, corporations, ESAs, and several others. We won't get into those. We're only going to focus on the district part. But in saying that, we apply the same performance standards and protocol to all seven different unique institution types. And I say that because with those standards, they're only revised just a little bit to meet very particular contexts. But in essence, they're the same for all institution types. Cognia always focuses on the learner. Even when you read the standard, you can see that it might say institution, but we're really meaning the institution must focus on the learner. In fact, our vision is this, and I'm going to read it to you. To impact and inspire education providers, which is what the district is, to advance and enable pathways of success for all learners. And when we write all learners, we mean each and every learner. So we're on to accreditation. Um, and what is it? And I don't want to duplicate what Dr. Cleveland so articul articulated, but it's a voluntary method. It actually started over 100 years ago for this purpose. And it was a joint effort between universities and colleges and high schools at that time to ensure that when a Carnegie unit was awarded, that it meant something. And so that was a way, a pathway, if you will, for accreditation. We've not moved too far away from that, but yet we've moved years and years away from that. As Dr. Cleveland described, we're not a compliant type organization. Our standards and protocol are not about compliance, meaning it's either yes or no. It is really stemmed foundationally on continuous improvement. But again, accreditation is recognition and it's a status that means a lot and it has for over 100 years. Again, we apply accreditation at all levels, the seven different institution types, for the purpose of making sure that all students have a pathway for success and all learners' needs are met. So what is our improvement journey? Connie's improvement journey, again, is a journey. And I hate to say it to all the, those who are involved, it never ends. The journey is just, it just keeps on going. So two years ago, when we first started the work, and Suzanne has been part of this much longer than I have, Accreditation was viewed as that event. It was like, whoo, I am so glad we have moved through that five-year or six-year part and we don't have to worry about advanced ed cognia for a while. That is no longer the case. It is continuous improvement, meaning whenever and whatever needs to be improved, it is reflected, data are, are real analyzed, and improvements are made. You're constantly in that motion of improving. We have standards, we have policies, we have assurances, and all of those requirements are part of our continuous improvement process. 
And we want to make sure that you as a district periodically engage in that type of analysis and review process. And you do get support from Cognia. And one of our requirements that we're really, really clear about is that you must, as a district, practice and embrace continuous improvement. And by the way, you do. So systems accreditation. We've, Dr. Cleveland touched on this, but I want to really, really emphasize that's the underlying foundation uh, for systems thinking. And when we think about systems thinking theory, we know a certain set of principles apply. In fact, there are six. So for systems thinking, we look at the wholeness of the district. How do you operate as a whole? We also make sure that there's a hierarchy, there's a protocol within the district for making decisions. We also want to make sure that self-regulation occurs. There, there's an openness about the district. Communication is transparent. That you're easily to adapt to change, which you've certainly demonstrated the past couple of years. That there's stability and flexibility within the district. All of those principles apply to systems theory, which again is part of our continuous improvement and systems accreditation model. But for systems accreditation, it simply means that the system, the district office itself, guarantees, guarantees that all the schools meet the quality assurance standards, meaning they meet all the standards that the district meets and then some. And so that is the reason why you're accredited as a district. And again, going back to Dr. Cleveland's comment, it used to be the high schools, but now there is a system-wide process and accreditation. So again, congratulations on that. So what is the meat, if you will, the substance of all this work? And they are what we call the performance standards and assurances. And they are, again, required by all the institution types. So a little bit about that. And our standards are, and I, I think it's really important that we look at this, they are based on research and effective best practices. And I can say that with um, great merit, I have led the past two development of the standards for Cognia, and it's always been a privilege to do that. It's actually over a year-long process just to develop the standard statements themselves. And we have a process in which we scan research, we look at data, we make sure that there's a lot of vetting. We go through criteria to make sure there are no emotionally charged words, that they're always easy to understand, free of jargon, and again, focused on the learner. And again, it's based on very rigorous research, and we have the data to show that. It's a powerful tool for driving improvement. You can use them anytime, so please keep them close and handy as you make decisions, not only for the district, but for the schools themselves. And again, it's supposed and designed to improve instruction, designed to improve organizational effectiveness, and again, focus on the learner. Thank you. They're divided into three domains. Let me show you what those are. And they are beginning in no particular order, it's just the way we frame them. The leadership capacity domain, they have a, there are 11 standards of quality in that domain. The learning capacity domain with 12 standards, and the resource capacity domain with eight. And if you add, can add like I can, that's a total of 31 standards for the district. Let's go to the next requirement, and that is what we call the assurances. So I've talked a little bit about continuous improvement. This is the only part of our protocol that truly is compliance-based, meaning that each one of these bulleted items, the policies and procedures, security and crisis management plan, the financial transactions, all of those actually have more descriptors than I've listed here, but it means that the district must comply to each one of these bulleted items as well as every school in the district. That's where that systems accreditation piece comes in. And the last one noted there means that this district has a quality assurance process to make sure constantly and continuously that all of these system compliant items are met by every school in the district, and you have. Now this is the work that we do. So now you have had the content itself, the standards, the assurances that are the yes, no compliant pieces, and now this is the work that the team engaged in, as every team engages in that goes through, um, that participates in engagement review. This protocol itself is standardized, meaning there are no changes. We go through extensive training to lead reviews. Team members go through training. Everyone knows exactly what's supposed to happen and when. And uh, it is followed throughout the seven institution types that I talked about earlier. It is a very rigorous process. I know you know it from one side. Uh, we invite you to participate on the other side, meaning the team side. And it is um, complex work. 
It means that you have to be able to synthesize data and information very quickly because there's a set amount of time in which to do that. And uh, people who volunteer to serve on the team do so most of the time and they're practicing practitioners. So we always appreciate the team members who give up their time. On this particular team, we had a person from New Mexico. He's actually a cognia colleague of uh, Dr. Murphy. So we had that context piece, which is really important. And cognia always ensures that there's someone locally, if you will, or regionally, who understands the, the regional or local context. And a little bit more about the team itself. We had five people, and that's a, no a normal number for the size district in which you had. We worked over three days, but we worked many days prior to actually what we call on-site, and this particular time it was remote. Um, at a high level, these are the actions and tasks that we engaged in, again, remotely. We were, we were all through Zoom. Uh, we evaluated and reviewed individually all of the documentation, and there was a lot, and it was all very pertinent, by the way, all the documentation that the district submitted. And they submitted the, dis the evidence by standard number, and oftentimes multiple uh, types of evidence. So each team member individually reviewed all the evidence, one by one. That we did that before we even met as a team. The second time we met, we began to rate the standards, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But we wanted to make sure that we understood what the evidence said relative to each standard. So there was a discussion about that to make sure there was full understanding, not only of the evidence, but making sure that we didn't miss anything in, in the meanwhile. Uh, once we were, quote, doing the review itself remotely, we began the interview process. And the system, um, thank you again to Carol for setting up the, those interviews and for the people participating in those interviews. We had outstanding participation. The interview questions were formed um, by the data. And so there were set types of questions that we'd ask every stakeholder group. We also made sure that um, there were schools, if you will, that were predetermined to interview. So we had a range of schools in the district that also had a special time to be interviewed by the team. Our job was to assess the quality of the learning environment. Um, typically, we would do that on site. Of course, we did not this time, but we interviewed enough people and our questions certainly led us to evaluate the learning environment. We rated each standard five times. Now, you remember I mentioned that there are 31 standards. We went through each standard, 31, five different times. It gets a little more complex than that. I'll show you in just a second, because I want you to, to understand the depth, the rigor, and the complexity so that when you, understand, when you hear the findings, it all makes sense to you. We use what we call an I3 rubric, and I'll show that to you in a moment. So when you see the I3 rubric, 31 standards rated five times collectively by the team through deliberations with all the evidence that you presented and then that came with the final ratings. And in the end, um, we produced a, a final report, we call it the Final Engagement Re Review Report, and that is in the hands of the district. And as Dr. Cleveland mentioned, they are going through that report now. So let's go to the I3 rubric. I just mentioned this. So the I3 rubric um, was developed, and I had the great pleasure of developing this along with our uh, CEO, Dr. Mark Elgard. And we did this because of the data that Cognia had. And from, believe it or not, we, we practice what we preach, and that is we believe in continuous improvement for ourselves. So we were looking at the data, meaning the standards rating that were coming from districts and schools around the world, and we quickly realized that we were expecting schools to give us information more about the engagement, how many people are involved, how many people attend meetings, also to what degree is a practice implemented and less on the results. Even though we had standards about results, we were not trying to glean that from the districts. So we developed this logic model that really centers on from engagement being a level that's important. You have to gain support from your stakeholders to engage and implement a process or program, all the way through embeddedness, which is the level of the highest level, which means this practice is fully ingrained in the, the district's culture. What's interesting about the I3 rubric is this, is that there can be high engagement, there could be great implementation, and, the, and those practices can be embedded in the culture. And oftentimes, and this is not unusual at all, if a practice or program is deeply ingrained in the culture, it means sometimes that you don't know why. It has been so ingrained that sometimes that the, the understanding of why we're doing this has been neglected. 
So the logic behind this is to follow this sequentially and logically reaching to the point of having something, a practice embedded in the culture, and you know why it's based in the, based in the culture. You can see the very first level, we call that level one, just like a rubric, going down uh, is the highest level of four. So the scores are one, two, three, and four. And let me just give you a few more numbers, and this is indicative of the commitment from the district and from the community. So the team remotely and the participants remotely um, participate in interviews over three days. And as a total, and you see the bottom line there, we had 196 unique individuals that participated in interviews. That is substantial given the format we had to use and everything else going on in the world this past February, and we certainly appreciate that. The interview data uh, are used as evidence. It's not the only evidence, we triangulate the evidence. So we use that as part of understanding the district's level of performance for each standard the all 31, and on each level of that I-3 rubric. And thank you for the governing authority. All of you were interviewed, and that was such a pleasure. Um, school administrators, 27. Look at the number of students. That's difficult to get students into a room behind a computer and talking to people that they you know, don't know. Um, we had a nice size of, a pa of parents to interview. So the, re the way in which these interviews are conducted is simply this. It sounds simple, but it's not always. We look at the data from the first team's ratings, and the data lead us to the questions that we need to ask. So it's on two sides of the coin, if you will. One, we want to make sure that we are, the ratings that we initially have are correct, if they're high, a three or four, according to the I-3 rubric. And we also want to make sure that if we've missed evidence and we're not sure why that rating is low, that we want to ask questions to affirm or confirm or find out the answers to that. So we start out with a set of interview questions that are very similar in concept and content for all stakeholders, and then we revise those questions to make sure that they fit that unique stakeholder group, but also they will change depending on the, the previous night's team's deliberations, because we don't want to miss anything. We want to make sure that the ratings are as accurate as possible. Again, we use a triangulation of evidence and nowhere in the report or any time do we single out one stakeholder group and use that as the basis for the rating of the standard. It has to be triangulated. And the findings. So this is the part that the standard ratings, the I-3 rubric, the interviews, and all of the evidence come together. And this is a part that requires extreme synthesizing skills on the team members. It requires a lot of deliberations. It requires making sure that the words that we choose are exactly the words that we need to choose. That saying words matter, they really do matter, not only in the findings that we presented at the end of the review, but most importantly, what words we choose in the report. Um, the findings, again, are based on quantitative and qualitative data, and again, a mixture of everything that we've learned in this condensed amount of time. Uh, I want to repeat again that we did the, conducted the deliberations five times and rated the standards five times up until the morning of the findings conversation. I always believe that everyone needs to, quote, sleep on the ratings one more night to make sure that the team does not reach consensus and do not believe in consensus. Everyone must be in total agreement that every single rating for every standard on every level, the I-3 rubric is accurate and to the best that we could possibly do given the amount of evidence and time that we had to conduct the review. So again, five different ratings. Okay, so if you'll click one time, thank you. This is just a screenshot of a table that is actually in the report. And this is in, uh, reflective of the resource capacity domain. And I just chose this one just because the colors are nice. but. Um, it's really what you have as far as all colors. And the blue indicate, I believe, impacting, and the green is improving. And that is a really great report. And, but I also want to show you that the I-3 rubric, remember that chart, is reflected here. So the first level of gray, it looks like, is engagement, then it goes all the way to embeddedness, and there's a rating next to each level of that I-3 rubric. So for engagement, here you have a four, if you look at standard 3.3, implementation is a four. Again, four is the highest rating. 
um, for results. It looks like it's a two, sustainability, a two, and for embeddedness of four. So this is an example of that model uh, description I gave you earlier where you can have high engagement of a practice for 3.3, I can't read it from here, but I think I know it, um, and implementation strong with fidelity, and it's highly ingrained in the culture, but you're not quite sure about the trend results and why it's working. Okay, so that's an example of that. But nevertheless, um, the overall standard, when all those calculations are completed, ends up being impactful practice for the district. Okay. So if you'll click again, I'd like to show you um, the results. So this box here shows all of the results from all the 31 standards and the same um, different levels of the I-3 rubric here. So overall, the district earned 13 impacting statements, which is tremendous, uh, 16 improving, which is again tremendous, two initiating, and we'll talk about those, and zero insufficient, which is highly unusual. Insu insufficient means you would have this really bold red color on that chart and you have none of those. And to only be rated two as um, initiating, again, is a, quite a success story. So congratulations on that. One more, yes. Thank you. Uh, one more click. Uh, remember I mentioned the IEQ earlier in the conversation, or I guess this is a one-sided conversation, isn't it? Um, anyway, the I IEQ is the Index of Education Quality, IEQ, and it ranges from 100 to 400, kind of a simple chart there. The average range, you can see this, is 278 point something 34 to 283. Well, look where you are. Your average, the first district accreditation journey that you've ever been on, and your average IEQ is not the average, actually IEQ is 330.81. You're going to start clapping yeah. again. All right. <laughs> so out of 400, which no school that I know of, D. Dr. Murphy, has earned a 400, you are in the top, top range of the average of the IEQ, top, top range. Again, that is, that is really something to celebrate, and I'm so pleased to be able to deliver that to you. The IEQ is recalculated every year, and it is decided by the commission, the overall accreditation commission for Cognia. Okay, thank you. All right, I think you'll like this visual. Probably gonna get tired of me saying I3 rubric, but I'm almost done with that part of it. Um, again, moving across, and you can see the first column, those are the levels. Um, then the rating, one, two, three, four. The level, I just picked out the key, the, a really quick word there. So when we have few stakeholders or few indicators of practice, uh, it's rated as a one. When there's some indication, it's rated as a two. When there's many, it's a three. So the word many, M-A-N-Y, that's a good word. That means a lot of people are involved, right? Or, or a lot of practices are done with fidelity. Most means almost all. Um, then moving after rating, you see again the five levels of the I-3 rubric. So let's look at the colors here. Uh, let's go with the positive first because there's so much positive here. If we look at the gold chart, the gold part, many, three, under engagement and implementation, you can look at those numbers. Seven for many, uh, 15 under implementation, score to three. If we look at most, 21 under engagement. That speaks so very highly of the commitment that the stakeholders in this district and throughout its schools have to in always improving. And then for implementation, 13 rated most. That's a lot. All right, we're going to skip the blue for a second and go back to um, the gold. Under embeddedness, remember that's the level where practices, programs, you name it, all the standards are ingrained in, this, in the district's culture. We have five under many, rating number three, but 23, 23. That is outstanding and it actually earned a finding that I'll talk about in a second. So overall, you can see visually that there is a high degree of engagement, buy-in, empowerment, implementation with fidelity. Everybody knows what to do and it's done well. And then they do it so well that it becomes part of, this is the way we operate here. This is how we do things here. Now we're going to go to the blue. Notice I put some softer colors so it wasn't so bold for you, but um, the blue means this. 
When we have results, meaning you're collecting data intentionally and you're using that data intentionally, well, we have some instances of it. We noted that. Again, we're basing this on our, the evidence and the process that we used. But also, you have 14 of the standards that were rated many with a three. That's good. Sustainability is defined this way on the I3 rubric, and it means that there's trend data that are captured, analyzed, and used over a two to three year uh, time. We would like it longer than that, but we're, we're very realistic because we know like state assessments change and other types of assessments change, just to give an example. So we go with two years as a trend. We would like it longer than that. What we noticed with our findings was that for the I3 rubric for sustainability, we rated 24 of the standards as some rating number two. So there's a little work to do there. Um, for many, there are uh, six of those for sustainability. So what sense can we make out of this visual representation here? And it goes back to something I've already said, and it's not unusual for a district or a school or any of our institution types to have some type of visual representation like this. And that again is engagement, people buy in, they know what to do, they do it well. Sometimes we get so busy that we know we have to collect data but we don't always analyze that data to the degree we need to to inform the decisions that we need to make and know if there's value and effectiveness of the program, practice, procedure, policy, fill in the blank. And then sometimes we change our minds and we don't always collect the same type of data or comparable data where we can make some sense out of what that means over, over time. And then again, embeddedness means that it's practiced well and it's embedded in the culture. Let me move here, okay. All right, this is from the report verbatim. So I'm gonna start with what we call the strengths and those are just my words for tonight, but I want this caveat to be heard loudly and clearly and publicly of course, and that is even in the areas that we noted could be improved, there were strong, strong indicators of strengths in those improvements. So when you read the report, in some areas you'll think, is this an area for improvement? It looks like we're doing really well. Precisely, you are. But if you keep moving through the report and a particular findings, you'll see that area that you can, you can revise and improve and it'll take you to the next level. But again, this is an excellent district with so many strengths, it'll be hard to name them all. But let's start with the first one. And this is in order as they appear up here in the report. And I wanna read it to you. And it says this, the district's mission permeates throughout its schools and is embraced by its stakeholders. That says a lot. Remember, we are very clear about the words that we use because stakeholders encompasses community. Not only people who work in the schools, who are employed by the district, but the community at large. And I think that's represented here tonight in the audience. So some of the areas that we wanna make sure that you all hear from the findings are this, that a uh, significant strength takes uh, of this nature for this, the mission to be permeated really is reflective of the strong leadership. And I start with you all as board members and of course Dr. Cleveland and her longevity. It also means there's strong leadership in the schools. Everybody has to live and breathe the mission and, and you are. The stakeholders know, follow and embrace the mission. That was just throughout, again, to, to use the word permeate, that is the exact word. In every interview, it was known and said and believed. People believe in where the district is going and what its purpose is. We found very strong evidence manifested in this outreach to stakeholders. You've done a tremendous job of working through how to communicate with stakeholders, making sure that there's a process in place where it's, it's coming to you and they feel free to give you information. Um, you focus on everyone's well-being, not just students, which is the primary group that you want to focus on, but the well-being of everyone, especially the two, past two and a half years. And the examples listed here on this slide are just a few of the examples of how that mission is manifested throughout the district such as your career and technical program. There are many more and you can read the report to find out, but we wanted to highlight this in itself. All right, I'm gonna read it to you again. 
and you're going to say, what's the difference between the two? Oh, there's a big difference. Uh, the district created a positive, respectful, professional, and collegial culture. Let me say this. A district can be so immersed and follow its mission, but it might have a terrible culture in which no one wants to work or no one wants to stay in. That is not your case. You've got a strong commitment to your mission, and as a result of that, but it's not always, your culture is extremely inviting, it's positive, it's nurturing. People really enjoy being part of this district, and there's tremendous pride about being an employee and a student at this district, so congratulations with that. Our findings indicated that there's an emphasis on developing relationships with all stakeholders. And what you know about culture, and I know you know a lot about culture, but I want to repeat this, is that probably the premise of a good culture in any organization is how you treat each other and how you develop relationships. And this district has made that a priority and it shows and it manifests in all its work. So a culture can be strong or weak, and it really is dependent upon how you nurture those relationships. And again, the interactions that you have with stakeholders, and they've been positive, trusting, and certainly many, many. So we appreciate the work that has been done to ensure the culture remains strong. It's something that you will work every day to sustain. We understand that. But again, it correlates with the mission, but not always. In your case, you do both. Um, we want to, I want to show you just a few items here that we thought were outstanding. Again, there are so many more, but when you think about what makes a strong culture and why people want to be here, and, and I know recruiting is tough on everyone right now, but you are doing things that really make people want to join your team, such as the early release days. That is embedded in the culture of Rio Rancho schools. The job like monthly meetings, that allows school people of different types of uh, across the district with similar jobs, assistant principals, coaches, and so on, to be together to discuss strategies, pedagogy, data, whatever is the topic, and then take that information back to their schools. And you have a very strong induction program. You take care of people as they enter into your school district. Okay, another strength. There is deep commitment to continuous improvement. Now, this is interesting. I read the readiness review report that was conducted, oh gosh, maybe three years ago. Um, that is to make sure that the district is a candidate for accreditation and for the engagement review. And actually, it was listed as an area to improve. And I read that, I thought, my goodness, what tremendous effort and commitment the district collectively and in the individual schools have made to continue to improve it in a very short amount of time. That is all inspiring. So through that process, it meant that you took it seriously, not only that area for improvement in the readiness report, but all of them. But this one really rose to the top. Um, what it also means that all the stakeholders, and we saw this through the interviews themselves, was that all the interview people that in part of the process we're very clear about continuous improvement, what it meant. We actually use the words, and sometimes when I lead reviews, I use the term continuous improvement, and I have to define it, and sometimes it sticks and sometimes it doesn't. In your case, in the district, everybody understood what continuous improvement was about, and they were very excited to be part of that. Some of this is due to the New Mexico DASH program, and we recognize that, but nevertheless, continuous improvement is continuous improvement, which means there are objectives that are set, data are analyzed, and you're monitoring the progress frequently, and people are talking about progress and setbacks and challenges and what to do to improve. Um, there have been a variety of methods to use to inform your stakeholders about continuous improvement, and that was also noted by the team. And the district's annual report, I believe that is uh, created by Dr. Cleveland and her team, is a powerful message to the district and its and stakeholders about what is happening in Rio Rancho schools. That is also part of continuous improvement. The surveys that are, are administered, that's a part of continuous improvement. The strategic plan, which I know has been on hold, uh, waiting on this report, is also indicative of continuous improvement. So again, a very, very deep commitment to that. 
We're going to move next to, and I'd label this as consideration for improvement because remember, in the report, remember that red color? You don't have any reds. If you had a red box anywhere on that re report, you would be required to address it. There is absolutely nothing, and it kind of hurts me to say this, but it's true, nothing in the report that you are required to address. That's huge. Every content piece listed in the report, every rating, every recommendation, commendation that is made in the report is up to you. It is up to you to dissect, to disaggregate, to decide, does it work for us? Is this something that we want to address or not? Again, you are not required by Cognia because you're fully accredited, all your schools in the district, to, to, uh, to move forward. You have nothing that's insufficient, and that includes the assurances. But for improvement, to consider, um, the process to collect and use trend data needs to be systematic. That's not the first time you've heard me say that tonight. Um, and if you were to ask me, okay, Vicki, what is one, one area to improve? That's the only, only number you get, just one. I would center on this one. And this is so doable for you all because you're very, very close. Here's what we ask, is that you find a systematic way of collecting data. It's almost like putting it on a calendar, if you will, of using systematic process to collect data, to know which data are important to you, make it intentional. It needs to match whatever you need to measure, that there's a, there's a triangulation of data, and that you use it with fidelity, okay? So what led us to this finding for you to consider is that when we talked about trend data with our different stakeholder groups, there seemed to be uncertainty among the sta stakeholders about that. Um, you have a process to collect data and use data, and it's certainly, certainly many evidence and, and examples of when you've used data to make decisions. We're, say, we're not saying you don't. We're just saying formalize the process. Make it very intentional because it is so important, especially given um, the resources that we all are concerned about around the country, as well as making sure that every learner reaches his or her potential. So again, intentional data on a schedule, a systematic process, and everybody knows what that is. Okay. Another consideration for improvement is the district's approach to curriculum and instruction is equitable. And by the way, your curriculum and instruction program is outstanding, and that includes your assessment program. But the fidelity of an implementation needs to be monitored. Here's what we found is that your curriculum instruction program is student-centered. It is, it is a great curriculum program. Even during the pandemic, it was, it was implemented very well. You have a well-developed assessment system. That means you're measuring how students are progressing in a number of ways through formative, summative, and interim assessments. Very great. You have a professional learning program that focuses on pedagogy, curriculum instructional strategies. You're doing all of that really well. Um, but what we found was that there was some inconsistency, especially during the interviews and according to the evidence, that students um, had fewer opportunities in some of the schools to learn social studies and science and to really take advantage of the STEM programs that you have here. So again, that monitoring piece is really associated with the fidelity of making sure that social studies and science, and the elementary grades especially, are implemented with fidelity. Um, we also recommended that you expand or consider expanding college and career readiness to elementary. And you're probably saying, how can that happen, Vicki? Uh, that's a high school program. We're not talking about CTE as it's noted in your district in, um, for high school. It means integrating that awareness in your elementary curriculum as well as middle school. Um, the other finding that we wanted to highlight here for you, your consideration to, for improvement is to reintroduce, note the word reintroduce, it's not introduce, it's bring it back. What we realized through the interviews as well as the evidence is that the problem solving, creativity skills, and collaboration have always been part of your instructional core. When the pandemic hit and we were you know, forced, you all were forced as others to do different types of learning instruction, um, teachers had to teach differently. That was just the norm. Now that students are back in the school,
teachers are certainly doing their very best. Everybody is working to, I guess, um, adapt. I'll use the word adapt. We really wanted to point out that now is the time to not revert back to a teacher-directed lesson, make it still student-centered, but reintroduce those skills into your instructional program and monitor that they are being reintroduced to your school children. Again, you, you have done it, we noted that, but let's bring it back. The last finding for consideration for improvement is this one. Standard operating procedures are established. They're everywhere. People know what to do in this district, and they do it. But an evaluation of their effectiveness needs to occur. So that goes back to the data piece. So you can see how the standards work together. The standards are also built as a system model. One works with the other. They don't work in isolation. So this one comes to the point of there is there's engagement about what type of procedures need to be developed. There's full implementation, and then if you go to embeddedness, it's part of the culture. But when we look at measuring how well do we know that this standard operating procedure or the set of them are really working, that's where we fall a little bit short and something to consider to improve. So again, going back to a process to make sure that you evaluate what might not be so evident to you. But you do it so often, just step back and think, why are we doing this? How do we know it really works? And are we getting the return on investment that we really need? Um, we want to acknowledge, though, how the recruitment process is working. You're being very innovative in that. We wish you well. That's, a, that's a, much of a challenge, we know. The budgeting process, which was also mentioned in the readiness review report two or three years ago, is amazing. And we want to commend you for that. And you have a very comprehensive set of policies and procedures, and that's the work of the board. So we acknowledge that. But given all that content, we still ask that you evaluate the effectiveness in a systematic way. In closing, again, this district is a high-functioning, high-quality, very effective district. It provides a high-quality, I'm overusing that word because I don't know of another word except excellent, um, education for all its learners. We saw great evidence of equity also. It's indeed a district that understands its community and is reflective about community needs and takes action. You're a strong force not only in this community, but around the state. And I want to also acknowledge that there are challenges that you address, and you do that in a very thoughtful way. At the helm, you have the stability of Dr. Cleveland, and I want to make sure that that comes out loudly and clearly in this presentation because all the strengths that we noted, as well as the challenges that you face now and have faced, you've done those with excellence. You've done that with the best decision that you could possibly make along with the board. But it takes stability and leadership to make substantial change. It takes stability and leadership with Dr. Cleveland and her cabinet to achieve what you've achieved as a district. So we appreciate the leadership that you have in this district. Um, with the leadership like Dr. Cleveland, the board, and the cabinet, it provides trust among the community. It provides that transparency and what you're going through as far as trying to recruit people to come to work here. People take note of Rio Rancho. You have so much to be proud of. It was my privilege to learn more about the district, to be part of your continuous improvement process. And again, I congratulate and thank you on behalf of Cognia for trusting us to come in and evaluate you, and you expose yourself. This is not easy to just say, here we are. Tell us what we're doing well. Tell us how we can improve. We want to know, and we want to know so we can take action. So we thank you, and I thank you on behalf of all Cognia. Thank you.